in order to go up, we have to leave all the things below. Mm -hmm. So if we get quiet here and you're holding on to something, you fill in the blank. It could be anything. It could be something like a, a sin that you did and you're thinking about it. It can be a, a ministry situation coming up that you're thinking about. It could be uh, the desire for a spouse or, you know what I mean? It can be a uh, just a weird, strange plethora of thoughts, like a bumblebee and then a flower, you know what I mean? Like, these, these kinds of things are all below. And to go up into the sweetness of the Lord, and this is the reason why most people don't experience the sweetness, is because they're too scattered. Yeah. They're all over the place. Even they're they're even um, grounded by good things. Grounded meaning kept on the ground. Um, it's, he's got to be the only thing. Christ has got to be the only thing, because that's when real worship yeah. happens. And the only reason why we've ever gotten quiet together is to give Jesus and Jesus alone all of the attention that he deserves. Yeah. That's that's the key. And there, this is how we're, we're lifted. The Spirit lifts those who look. Yeah. And so if you, if you will look at the Lord, the Spirit will lift you. You don't have to lift yourself. You can't lift yourself. But if you look, he'll lift you. But if you're looking around, then the Spirit will never take you up because... In reality, he only wants to exalt Jesus. And so that's the reason why he only lifts those who look to Jesus. Because he has a desire to, to, to go like this with Christ. And he's like, hey, actually, if I was to like ex explain it in a mystical way, the scripture says that proceeding forth from the Father is the Spirit. Proceeding forth. It's, the Spirit is coming out of the Father always. Like this. It's almost like wind coming down out of the Father that hits the earth and picks Christ up as, as in his, the human Christ and lifts him up above all. And so it's like the, the Father's opening, the Spirit's flowing down and pulling up Christ. Mm -hmm. And only those who will, will look at Christ will get in the wind and be taken up. And so that's the reason why most people don't know what it is to be blissed out. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> when, when, you, when you start talking about things like when you start talking about things like needlessness, most people are like, what does that even mean? But needlessness is when Christ has become the fulfillment of all desire. Yeah. Yeah. And this is the key for a holy life. This is the key for hearing God. This is the key for uh, being delivered from all of the oppressions that are just constantly pushing on us as humans living in a, in a fallen world. Because you know this is the only hell you'll ever know. Mm. And for the, for the unbeliever, this is the only heaven they'll ever know. Mm. So we're in this in-between state. And if we will just look, then we will live. So I want to encourage you. We're going we're gonna to get quiet as you guys do. And you guys are well familiar with it. But I just want to remind you. What you get today is up to you. In other words, how much attention are you going to give to him? And, and based upon that will be what he's able to, to do in, in your life. And listen, if you do find yourself going off, like you're there and you're just wonderfully looking at the Lord, and then all of a sudden you start thinking about clothes in the dryer that you left. You know what I mean? Or, how am I going to get my clothes clean this week? You know what I mean? Things like this. If you're doing that and you notice it, the moment you notice it, don't beat yourself up. Just simply go back. Mm -hmm. Just, oh, oh, I noticed I've gone off. Lord, I worship you. You know, And you may have to go, Lord, I worship you a hundred times mm -hmm. in three minutes. But the reality is, is you're training your inward eye to always be inclined upward. Mm -hmm. I'm, all, I'm just, you're, you're training your inward eye just to continue. That's the essence of prayer anyway, looking unto Jesus. And so the, the and as you guys know, and you probably experience in your, in your life, the more you get quiet before the Lord and linger with Him, the, the easier it is to abide in Him. Yeah. Because you're, you've inclined. Mm -hmm. you, you're, you've learned to incline your, your eye, your inward eye, upward. You guys know your eyes, you have eyes in your heart. 
You guys know that. It's, Paul says, may the eyes of your heart be enlightened. You have yeah. eyes to see on the inside. They've got to look at the Lord. And so as you are, are learning to just constantly remain like this, then when you're at work or you're on the street preaching or you're in the midst of a, a crowd, you can slip into a disappearing place. You can, you can go into the secret place in any place because you've learned how to, to, to look up. In, in essence, the secret place is, is not a location. The secret place is a state of being. Yeah. And you're looking unto the Lord. You're, he, it's, it's the Christ. Uh, you're consciously, you're, you're in conscious union with Christ. That's the essence of prayer. You know, pray, we've, we've, you guys know this, and I know I'm talking to the choir, but we know prayer is not words. Yeah. You know, like, oh, Lord, do this, do this, do this. Prayer has n really nothing to do with words. As a matter of fact, Jesus says, when you pray, say. In other words, prayer and saying are separated by Christ. Mm -hmm. Prayer is a, is a state of the heart. And then, you, yes, you can speak in prayer, but prayer is what wow. you become. Yeah. Like David says, where, where is it? One of our favorite scriptures. Once. Once. once what is it? One, something. Yeah, I think maybe 105.7 or something, something like that. Where it's, David says, I am prayer. Yeah. And he's become prayer. So we, we, Madame Guyon said, prayer is the, the application of the heart to God. And then she says, and the internal exercise of love. <laughs> oh my God. That, that's the essence of prayer. Now, that's, there may be words, there may not be words, but so what I'm saying is that we just, when we get into this conscious union with Him, I'm just conscious of my union with you, you're in prayer. And then you may say something, you may say nothing, but you are in the flow of that flowing Spirit. The Spirit flows down and takes you up into the Lord. And so this is how uh, we, we live, move, and have our being in God, you know? Just constantly just lingering and and able to be aware of the Lord. Listen, if we don't have awareness of the Lord, then we don't have new life. Mm -hmm. That's what that's what new life is. The, the ability to perceive God. Mm -hmm. Your inability to perceive God was your fallen state. Mm -hmm. But now you've been born again, and you have new life. And now you can perceive God. And it should be the highest delight known to man. We were talking the other day, me and John. Uh, somebody was preaching about prayer, and they said, prayer is boring. And I was like, this guy needs to be born again. <laughs> How can you come to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? <laughs> I mean, how can you worship in spirit and in truth, join the angels and the living, flowing light of the Godhead and say that that's boring? It, it makes no sense. This should be the, the craving of all of our hearts. To constantly be aware of the Lord. I'll say one last thing, and then, and then we'll just, just get quiet before the Lord. I was sitting with my daughter the other day. She's fourteen, and mind is everywhere. And she says, "Daddy, I can't. I just don't experience God in prayer. It's so hard to experience God in prayer." And I said, "Come here, sit down next to me." I said, "Number one, I showed her in the Bible where it says in Psalm one thirty nine, if I make my bed in hell, you are there." Mm -hmm. Where can I go from your presence? So what does that tell us? It tells us that the presence of God is absolutely everywhere. Say this with me. Say the presence of God, the presence of God, is, God is everywhere. Is everywhere. That means the issue is not entering his presence because you can't get out of it. It's, the issue is awareness of who, he who is here. And then I told her, the scripture shows us also that we have received the Spirit. The Bible says that we are the temple of the Spirit. The Spirit of God is housed by our bodies. So you, he is, he's invading you from without and within. So he's, he's, he's in you, this, and he's outside. So he's everywhere. So I said the issue now becomes awareness. And I told her that he who comes to God must believe that he is. And that in and of itself is the awareness of his person that, that enables us to perceive him and enjoy him. And it's so simple. Madame Guyon said, if we really understood prayer, we'd realize it's easier than breathing. And I encourage
encourage you, if, if this is not your way of life, then make it today. Uh, make a change. That, that's the way you're going to live your life. So the prayer should be the, be the best thing of your day. Mm -hmm. Prayer should be the highlight of the entire day. You should be longing to come away. You have to value the presence of the Lord for the person of the Lord more than valuing God for what He can do. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And, and that in and of itself will help you be completely satisfied all the time in prayer. Yeah. Because uh, some people are unsatisfied because they're waiting for God to do something, not yes. realizing that Him being there was the goal. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, people are always... Uh, there's, there's a way I wrote it down one time that was really good. It was like, uh, people are waiting for something to happen, not recognizing His presence is the happening. Yeah. Yeah. So, this, is, this is everything. You know, to be aware of him is, is all. So I wanted to ask those questions because I want you to realize that everybody was being ministered to in some way. Yeah. You know, and it's different for each person. Like you have people that are seers and that's what they, they see very easily. You have some people that are more teachers and they can they, the scriptures are always, you know, just like the center of the way God speaks to them. Some people are real feelers. And when I say feelers, everybody should be a feeler on the inside. Mm -hmm. But there are some people that are feel feelers on the outside. Uh, you know, like some people feel honey, you know, like hot honey on, like, on their hands. Some yeah. people feel like, uh, I, I, sometimes I feel like somebody put Ben Gay on my heart. <laughs> it's just burning, like right here in my, in my chest area. Uh, some people, you know, they feel stuff on their, just come down upon their head. You know, so there's, there's just different types of people, but I, I ask those questions so that you could realize again that He's here yeah. and He is working in our hearts in, in many different ways. So, um, let me ask you this. Did anybody sense something that they actually felt was for the room? Um, I mean, yeah, it's kind of even what the Lord was doing with me personally um, this morning, just alone with Him. But, so he showed me a vision, um, where, so what I like to do sometimes to go into heaven is I like to picture this ladder and just climbing up the ladder and just kind of ascending in that way. And so as I did that, climbed up the ladder, right away where I ended up was, I just saw this gold street, um, and it was kind of like liquid gold, it was kind of like just... It was alive. It was moving. And then on this side, just on the left side, was a white horse. And on the right side was a white horse as well. And I was sitting on one, and Jesus was sitting on one. And we were both just riding it, just down the road. Um, and we were holding hands, but we weren't speaking. And on the right, on the left, there were just these trees. Um, the trees were like dancing, moving, but same thing. They weren't, they weren't speaking. Um, it was pure silence. Just, and then I look into the, the heavens, into the clouds, and it's like I see like eyes and a mouth on the clouds. So, but same thing. They weren't speaking. Um, so it was very, very silent. And then as we continue to walk um, on the or on the horses as we continue to ride on the horses, all of a sudden they begin to fly into the clouds. And it's kind of like almost the clouds is the floor and we just come up from into, into the clouds. And now as you go through the clouds, there's like just this castle kind of thing. Just, yeah, just this castle. And so then we, we go through the gate and we go into this hallway and in this hallway I see a whole bunch of doors um, and they're open. The doors are open and as I look inside the doors, the room is all just black. Um, they're all black. As you look into the doors, they're all black, but there's like countless doors down this hallway and all of them are black as you look into them. Um, and as you look into them, or as you walk into one of the doors, 
um, into the room, I just see a light all the way kind of like in the end. Um, and so black to me, it just represents mystery, just the mysteries of the Lord, you know? And so I feel like there's just, even as you were saying, just a simple invitation to just be, to just be, to not speak, to not do anything, but simply just be. Um, and I think that's what it even was with just riding on the horse with Jesus, just holding hands, not even speaking, um, and the trees, not even speaking, the clouds, not speaking, and then coming up into the clouds, and then just the Lord showing all of the endless and possible, just, just possibilities that there is to experience Him in different ways. And I think that's what the doors are presented in the rooms of just coming into the mysteries of the Lord that He has for us. Like, the doors are open. I think that's what he's saying. The doors are open. Um, and just be. Like, just be. That's it. That's good. Yeah. Well, let's, let's just put your hand on your heart. Let's, let's pray. Father, we receive your invitation. I pray none of us will forget that the doors are wide open. Keep our hearts quiet before you. We may enter into your wonderful reign. Your, the reign of your kingdom. And find there the mysteries of your person. Oh Lord, take us into the many mansions of your person. In your precious name, take us in to to the many the many mysteries. We worship you. Amen. Now, has anybody ever heard of Teresa of Avila? Yeah. yeah. Who, who said yes? I mean, it's because of you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but she wrote a book called. Um, interior castle and she connects when Jesus says in my father's house are many mansions Mm -hmm. and how Jesus says my father's house shall be called a house of prayer she merges those Mm -hmm. two and says that when you enter into prayer you're entering into the house of the person of the Lord and there are many rooms the interior castle so that God has set up his kingdom Mm -hmm. on the inside of you and you Mm -hmm. there's so much of him that can be experienced and so it reminds me your vision reminded me of that, um, and I would just encourage each each one of us to uh, to remember that there's no limit to this thing. Mm-hmm. That sometimes we get to a point where we where we're like, I've, I mean, what else is there? Well, let me just tell you, the biggest deception in the world is that God is not limitless. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like hey, I'm going to get to the end of God. No, you're not. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know? So there's a there's a plunging of God that is never ending. Yeah. And so I, I say to some people sometimes, I got it kind of from, from Frank Viola. Does anybody know Frank Viola? I'm going to say a bunch of names today. I encourage you, if you're interested in, interested in going into a little bit deeper uh, things of the Spirit, write down these names. <laughs> because I'm saying their names for a reason. Because they, they touch something in very, di- very different ways. Good. But Frank Viola said, what will, what, so he had started a, a community work. And then people came in and said, what will you do in differences of opinion? come up, different doctrines, mm-hmm. and his response was, we'll get to those things after we've exhausted the riches of Jesus Christ, wow. <laughs> <laughs> okay. and so, but that is the picture of the interior castle, mm. there are many rooms oh my God. Yeah. that you can explore and experience, and listen, every time you experience a room, more open up, yeah. so it's like God, he, when he fills you he simultaneously expands your ability to be filled. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So he's constantly expanding you. He's gaining more and more ground in your heart and, and in your life through this, this quietness, this, uh, this, this getting alone with him and giving him all our attention. We know that the scripture tells us that in quietness and trust, that's our strength. Yeah. Yeah. And so a lot, of, a lot of people don't have strength in their Christian life. Mm-hmm. They're Christians. But they're falling all the time. They have no victory over sin. They, they don't feel like they're delivered. You know what I'm saying? They, they say things like this. And we, have, we had a friend that would, that would say this. He'd say, the Bible says, Jesus says that then you will know the truth and the truth shall set you free. And then he says, that's not true in my life. He says, I know the truth and it hasn't set me free. And so when, when this guy said this to me, I was just like, something is wrong here. <laughs> So it's, it's this experience of the person of Jesus Christ that is the missing link. Yeah. 
You know, like we've we've talked about many many times and, and in many circles. I'm sure you guys have had conversations that are very similar where many have eclipsed the God of the Word with the Word of God even. Where they think that because they recognize black and white that they're entering into an experience of Jesus. But Jesus says in 539 of John, he says, you're searching the scriptures because you think in the scriptures are eternal life. But they testify of my person. So he's like, this book is given to you as a means to experience a person, not as an end in and of itself. Some people stop right at the text and they think that because they know the Bible or they went to these, they know these principles that that's it. But everything is unto Christ. So when, when we have a people that are weak and frail, it's because they're not experiencing the living Christ. Yeah. The, the person of Jesus actually experienced in their life. That's why there's no growth in some people's lives. Some people are, are, are saved 15 years and they're not even yet two years old yet in God. Mm-hmm. Are they saved? Yeah, I believe they are They are saved, but they're just undeveloped. Yeah. So Witness Lee once said, I'm saying names like crazy here, okay? <laughs> Witness Lee once said this. He said, mm-hmm. everybody possesses the same quality of life. And what he's saying is whether you're 8 or 88, if you've been saved for 8 years or 88 years, the quality of divine life that you've received is exactly the same. Then he says, but... The maturity of that life is contingent upon the consistent reception of that life. Mm. So the more you receive Christ into yourself, the more you eat of Him, the more He expands you. He also went on to say that the greatest counsel He can give you in your Christian life is, is a question. And that question is, how much are you eating? Wow. I think that's that's the greatest counsel I've ever heard. I think it puts Sozo to shame. How much are you eating? Do you guys know what Sozo is? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So praise God for Sozo. But Sozo can only help you to the degree it gets that's you to right. eat Christ. Yeah. Right. It, it is the eating of Christ that changes the inside of the man. Remember, we, we need nutrients that will give us the 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 nature of the Lord. So you need there's three N words. The first one is nourishment. Mm. The second one is mm. nutrients and the third one is nature. Mm. So there's no way to get to the nature of God without the nourishment mm. that gives the nutrients of God. So mm. you need the nourishment of God. Jesus says to to us that he presents himself to us as bread, remember? He says I am the bread of life. He actually says in John 6, he says, I am the bread not only that came down, but comes down. Mm -hmm. A perpetual Mm -hmm. coming of the Lord. A perpetual eating of the Lord. Mm -hmm. And so that nourishment gives you these divine nutrients that cause you to walk out His nature effortlessly. Not, I'm working on my love. Mm -hmm. No, I've eaten Him who is love, and He's coming out of me as love. It's a, it's a completely different uh, ballgame. One of them is religion, and the other one is life. You have two things that ju- is a juxtapose. That they're completely on opposite ends of the spectrum. Religion and life. Mm-hmm. Religion can't give life. Yeah. And life destroys religion. This is why the, the, the <laughs> wineskins burst. It's because life is in the wine. Mm-hmm. And the old wineskin wow. is religious disciplines and trying to, to, to adhere to principles. And when you try to put the, the life of the Spirit inside of a principle, he, brought, he just burst it. He's so much higher than principles. This is why in the beginning you see the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Do you remember this? Mm-hmm. Now, now think about what those words are. The tree of the knowledge, the knowing of good and evil. So you have people living their lives trying to conduct themselves based upon what they know is good and what they know is bad. Like, I know this is good and I know this is bad. And I'm going to live my life not doing the bad things and I'm going to start living my life doing the good things. The problem is they're still eating from a tree that can only give death. Because the scripture says, if you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will surely die. In other words, death 
and knowing what's right and wrong are all in the same realm. Wow. And, and so he's saying, there's something so much higher I have for you. It's called the tree of life. Wow. And we know that the tree of life, as it says in Proverbs, because remember the writer of Proverbs knew the book of Genesis. Remember that. He had the, the first five books of the Bible. He had this. He writes knowing the first five books of the Bible. So he knows about Genesis when he writes in Proverbs that that a desire fulfilled is the tree of life. Yes. So he's calling your attention back to Genesis. And he's saying, this is what the tree of life is. When Jesus fulfills, God fulfills yeah. all mm -hmm. your desires yeah. on the inside. Yeah. And so God has called us to something so much higher than right and wrong. Yeah. He's yeah. called us to receive Christ as a life source and life yeah. supply. Mm -hmm. And as we do, his nature is just in us. And we accomplish more on accident than we ever did on purpose. We're living effortlessly flowing out with what's called fruit. You know what I'm saying? Fruit itself destroys the mentality of works. Oh, yeah. The word fruit is, is like an assault on works. And works is an assault on fruit. The words are completely different because fruit is effortless. It's just born by life. It's evidence of life. It just comes out by life. Work is tilling and trying and twisting and turning. We don't want anything to do with that because that's the sweat of man's brow. That's the curse. Yeah. Striving is the curse. Enjoyment is the covenant. Mm, wow. So we've been pulled into a covenant of enjoyment that gives life supply on the inside. You get life and you literally have something in you that was not there in and of yourself. And you have, y'all you have experienced this. I know it many times that you've felt love in your heart for somebody when there's no reason. How many of you have felt like this before? Yeah. That's called the fruit of the Spirit. And remember, the fruit is not your fruit. It's the fruit of the Spirit. It's, it belongs to Him. He is the seed that comes in just like fruit comes from a seed. So the Spirit is sown into us. And then He grows up in us. And His own characteristics start to come out of us. This is a real Christian life. And I say all that connected to quietness because in the quietness is where you find needlessness. Mm -hmm. And needlessness is where the seeds get in you. Mm -hmm. Now I have to throw, I have to mention the Word of God because the Word of God is the mirror in which we behold the glory of Christ. So we need the Spirit to turn on the lights so that we can look in the mirror of the Word to see the glory of Christ. So just like if, the, if all the lights were off in this room and you opened up the Bible. No, let's say it like this. Let's say there's a mirror right here, okay? And all the lights are off in the room. Would you be able to see yourself in the mirror? You can't because there's no, there's no light. So the Spirit gives light mm. wow. so that you can look inside the mirror, which is Christ. Mm. And in, in looking in the mirror, which is Christ, you can see the glory of God. Mm. He's turned towards the Father, the, so the Father's right, let's say the Father's right here, and Jesus is turned towards the Father, like this, as a mirror. And the light is the Spirit. So by the Spirit, you look into Christ, and He's showing you God the Father. Wow. So this is the beauty of, of the Trinity. Jesus is saying, there's only one thing I want you to see. It's Him. And the Spirit is saying, let me turn on the lights for you, because you can't see Jesus without me. And so when you get quiet, you're giving the Spirit time to turn on the lights so you can look into Christ and see God, see the glory of God. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is how we enjoy the glories of Christ. And I'm telling you, the scriptures themselves reveal the glories of Christ. As a matter of fact, when you look in the scriptures, uh, you see this phrase. Um, uh, how, how's the phrase go? Let's look at it. It's in 2 Corinthians uh, Let's look at verse 17. Now the Lord is the Spirit. <laughs> wow. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Um, notice, notice that there's no in-between here. He doesn't give levels of this. He just, he's like, listen, where the presence of the Lord is, there's liberty. Wow. So where there's no liberty, there's no presence. And Now remember, God is everywhere. So what is he talking about? He's talking about the awareness of of God's presence brings liberty in your life. 
and where you don't have liberty, there's not an awareness of God's presence, right? Now, now look at what he says next. He says, but we all with unveiled face. I looked up that word for unveiled, and it actually means to be completely removed. Wow. It, it, it doesn't say, like, partial. There's, it, in other words, it's completely gone. All the obstacles on your eyes that were blocking you from being able to see Jesus are gone in the unveiled face, mm -hmm. right? So it says, unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. Beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. Are you seeing it? Mm -hmm. Now remember that the glory of the Lord is not only the radiance of His person. How many of you have ever seen like the light rays that come out of Christ? Let me, let me see your hands if you've ever seen the light. Okay, so you've seen in His splendor, He's beautifully dispensing light out of His person, right? He's just, he's just insanely gorgeous in, in the way that He... Ex what, what would you call it? He, he's just illuminative. He's... But there's also another understanding of the word glory, and it is perfections. Mm -hmm. So not just is he radiant, but his character is glory. Mm -hmm. He's perfect love, perfect peace, perfect joy, mm -hmm. perfection of holiness. He is kind and tender and true and just. And he is just all of these things. And that's the glories of Jesus just as much as his radiance. As a matter of fact, I would say, I'd venture to say they're the same thing. Those light rays that you're seeing are his character yeah. mm -hmm. coming out of him. And so this is the beauty and splendor and majesty of the Lord. It's the rays of love that come out of him. The rays of patience and peace. The rays of justice. It, it's all coming out of him. Right? And so when you look into the scriptures, you are able to look at the rays of his glory. Because his character and nature are seen here. And when you can see those character, that character and nature here, you're witnessing the light rays of his being. You're seeing the glories of Christ. That's why the scriptures are so precious to us when the Spirit turns the light on. Because you can look in the mirror and behold the glories of the person of Jesus Christ. Now look what happens to you when you do this. He says, he says we're all being transformed. Do you notice that it says being transformed? It doesn't say you are transformed. Mm -hmm. In other words, it's a continuous work. It, he's transforming you and transforming you and transforming you. And then he goes on to say, into the same image. That's nature. Mm -hmm. So now he's passing his nature into you by showing himself to you. So when you, you're perceiving the glories of Jesus, and he's making you like himself. He literally, he's dispensing his person into you. This is just glorious to me. Then it says, from glory to glory. It's important to recognize, and, and I want to insert this here because it's important, especially for, for us who, you know, who have been saved, mm -hmm. for those of you who have been saved for a short time. Glory to glory means... That he gives you something and you feel like that is the most incredible mm -hmm. maximum you can ever experience. Mm -hmm. But that is only building you to be able to receive another glory. Mm -hmm. So he gives you the glory and you're like, whoa, this is wonderful. But you're, you don't realize that that reception of glory is preparing you for a greater reception of glory. And he's just building on your life like this. So... What does that mean? There's a story of a, uh, a little boy that goes in to see a potter while the, a potter's working on a piece of clay. Have you ever seen a potter work on a piece of clay on the, on the wheel? Mm -hmm. yeah, so the, the wheel's turning, the, the clay is being formed, and sometimes it plops over, sometimes it just looks like nothing. A little boy walks in and he sees this potter in his potter's house with, with pottery everywhere, and he's working on one piece, and the little boy says, what's... What's wrong with that one? Because it didn't look like any of the other ones. And so the potter looks at him and then he says, Nothing. It's perfect. Mm -hmm. And the boy says, That's not perfect. And he points at the finished pots all around. And then he goes, Those are perfect. Mm -hmm. And then the, 
potter looks at him and then he goes, no, those are finished. Mm. And so the point of the story is that God is working on you. <laughs> and for what yeah. the potter, the stages of pottery, for what it needs to be in this moment, it's perfect. Does that make sense? Yes. Like today I'm working on it. I'm trying, my goal today is just to get it to face this way. You know, it looks retarded, but for today, it's everything it's supposed to be. So, so you've pushed it this way, and then you get up and you look at it, and you're just like, oh, perfect. Perfect for what? For right now. Because there's a big goal and a, finish, and a finishing that will come about. So I say that to apply it to you. You may feel like there's still so many areas in your life that are just kind of undeveloped. Mm -hmm. And you may look at yourself and you may be like, man, you know, I just, I'm, I've given everything to the Lord, but I just feel like there's still these things mm -hmm. in my heart. Listen, you're perfect. Mm -hmm. Right where you are, as you're laid down before the Lord, you're perfect. Mm -hmm. You're not finished, mm -hmm. but you're perfect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this is very important for us to understand because we can get on ourselves. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And we can compare ourselves. And just because somebody's really developed in one area and you're not much developed in that area, area, don't think that there isn't areas in you that they're not developed in. You, you understand what I mean? It's just important to recognize that God makes his man through a lifetime. And he's not expecting you to be perfect tomorrow. He just wants you to be wholly given over to the process. Just be his. Just be in his hands. And be content to be in the hand as much as on the shelf. Or to be, be content to be on the shelf just as much as being in the hand. Yeah, yeah. So some of us want to be the one that God is using all the time. You know what I mean? It's just kind of like in us as humans. Like, I'm the one. I want to be the one. But the reality is, is this. Wow. To be His is what makes us at rest. Mm -hmm. Whether I'm on the shelf or in the hand, I'm His. Yeah. That's what's most important. Not if I'm used or I'm, or I'm not used. You may be going through a season right now where you're just with the Lord alone. You're still His. You're not more His in His hand than you are on the shelf. Mm -hmm. You are equally His whether you're on the shelf or in the hand. Mm -hmm. And this needs to be something that just puts us at rest. You know, I have some friends that they don't want to work a secular job because they, they feel like it's like below. It's like below what God has called them to do. Okay, let me just explain something to you. You're not going to be more His when you're in ministry than you were before you were in ministry. Yeah. You, you know what I'm saying? So it's, it's important. It's just important because then we, we, we set up goals for ourselves mm. that we're unable to meet because it's in our own human strength and by our own human method. But it's better just to rejoice that you belong to Him have all rest and all peace there and that he's working in your life and that he is sovereign enough to arrange everything the way it needs to be, when it needs to be, whether you understand it or not. It's just so much better to be that way. I've talked a lot about sheep re recently because I really like them. I really like sheep. I, I went driving the other day with my daughter just trying to find sheep to take pictures of and I found some really good ones. I put them on my, my, my laptop and stuff. They're just amazing to me. They're so meek and mild. No one has ever seen a sheep and like been afraid that he's going to kill him. You know what I mean? They're not intimidating at all. They're just so sweet. You know, and when you kill a sheep, as you know, they're silent. Even as the scriptures say, Jesus was silent going to the slaughter like a lamb. Now a goat, you couldn't do that with. <laughs> the goats have their own will and they run their own way. But sheep are looking for something and it's the shepherd. And so Jesus is called the good shepherd, which makes you sheep. And then when we see in Psalm 95, we see, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our God, our maker. That's worship, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the sheep of his hand. So you see, sheep and worship are put together. When you are sheeply, oh. that's worship. And when you worship, you are sheeply. Sheeply is my own word, I made it up. <laughs> but like the sheep a couple of things that are really interesting about sheep that I think are all, they, we need to keep this stuff before our minds okay mm -hmm. and I think before I say this I need to say that remember God has preordained all the things that we know in life right. to be able to communicate with us mm -hmm. remember he who speaks to you today is the one who made the world 
So when, when, when he speaks to you about, about light, it's a pre-installed situation that was arranged to be able to communicate to you. Does that make sense? Yeah. For instance, many, many of you eat every day, right? I yeah. hope everybody does. How many of you have never eaten in your life? <laughs> no, you eat because you need it to live. Is, yeah. it, is it not true? Yeah. God arranged that principle on purpose beforehand to communicate something to you. It's almost as if the Trinity's in heaven and they're about to make man and they say, hey, they're going to need a way to really understand what we are for them. Therefore, let's install in their existence a principle called food for life. That they need to eat or they die. Then when I come in front of them, I can communicate so much to them by standing up and saying, I am food for you. Wow. Now they understand what I am for them. He can communicate so much with just one, one statement. It's like this with light, life, love. This is why bridal language is so beautiful. That's pre-installed. I mean, in the beginning, a man was given a, presented a woman. And in the end, the man, Christ Jesus, is given a woman. I mean, you, you see the bookends of the entirety of Scripture is a man and a woman. The first Adam, the last Adam. Both have brides. And it's all pre-installed to, ex to explain to us that God wants love from us. The, the, he's coming back for a bride, meaning he's looking for love. And so all, all this to say, sheep are also a pre-installed teaching point that Jesus himself pulls from and that we see even the psalmist talking about. So a couple of things about sheep that are very interesting. Number one, sheep don't know the way. Wow. wow. <laughs> I love that. It's so good. It is so simple, but it's like, <laughs> it is important. Oh my gosh. I mean, to, to think that a sheep knows the way, a shepherd would never follow the sheep. Because they don't know where they're going. Mm -hmm. The shepherd leads the sheep. Are you following me? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> sheep don't know the way. But you know what they are aware of? The shepherd. Mm. Which shows me it's more important that I'm giving all my attention to him than me knowing what to do. It's more important that I know he's right here, his presence, than me knowing what he's going to do. Can you imagine Jesus standing up in front of the sheep? Like a, a shepherd standing up in front of the sheep. He gathers them all. They listen to him. You know, they hear his voice. They all come. He's got, let's say there's a hundred sheep in front of the shepherd. And the shepherd looks at the sheep and goes, hey guys, okay. The terrain we're about to come up to is steep and it is rocky. You know what they'd be doing? <laughs> they'd literally just be looking at him, looking at his hands. And they're like, look, I don't know what he's doing, but he, he's trying to communicate something to us, but we don't understand what he's saying. He's of such a higher consciousness, the sheep don't get it. It would be ridiculous for the higher conscious shepherd to think that he can communicate the way to the sheep. It's so much like this with us. God's infinite knowledge is so grand, he, your, in, your finite mind cannot understand the infinite plan. And because of that, it's better that you just give your attention to the shepherd mm. than try to figure out what's going to happen mm. or what's next. And You, you understand? Yeah. This is going to set us free from so many things. Yeah. Yep. Wow. Because there's a lot of races people have entered that God never designed for them. They're running to finish lines, false finish lines. <laughs> he, never, he never gave that to you. I remember Todd said to me one time, Martha was busy making sandwiches Jesus never ordered. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so all, all this to say, the sheep focus on the shepherd. They listen to the shepherd. They trust the shepherd. And the shepherd guides them by still waters. He brings mm -hmm. them to green pastures. Mm -hmm. He restores them. And this is what he does. He, 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 he has a staff in his hand. You know, and you know the staff is for uh, not only protection, to protect him from wolves, but also for correction. It's got a hook on it. So if you start going the wrong way, he just goes like this and pulls you, you know, pulls you back. Isn't it beautiful, too, that if a sheep does get lost, Jesus says that he leaves the 99 to find the one? Yeah. 
So any any time that you feel like you you've lost sense of the presence of the Lord, mm-hmm. remember this: He's leaping over the mountains to find you. Mm-hmm. He comes looking for you. I mean, remember in Song of Solomon when she loses consciousness of Him through neglect and through uh, laziness. You remember this? He comes looking for her. Now listen to these words. It says he's, he came looking in the windows, plural. He didn't just kind of take a look in the first window as she came home and left. He goes around every window of the house looking for her. She's got to be here. And this is how the Lord is with us. I don't know if you've had times where you just lost consciousness of the Lord and you started getting irritated really easy. You're just frustrated. You just want to flip off the entire world. Do you understand what I'm talking about? Do you ever get like this? Well, in the, you're internally restless on the inside of you. And then all of a sudden, one of your favorite songs mm. between you and Jesus, somebody comes walking by, listening to it, and you can hear it. You know what I'm saying? Or a, a fragrance that is very special to you and Jesus. Somebody walks by, and you can smell it, and you're like, oh, it's, he's looking in the windows. Mm. He's looking for you. Mm. Or you see a phrase on a billboard, presence is power. <laughs> you know what I mean? Or power is presence. You know what I mean? For like a, an ad of some kind. Have, have anybody else had these kind of things? Yeah, or the Lord like spoke to you one day through Papa Smurf. Like he showed you everything about Papa Smurf and you're just like, Papa Smurf. Then you go to get ice cream one day and they're featuring Papa Smurf on the cups. You're, that's Jesus looking in the windows for you to remind you of his love for you. And remember that when, when he finds her, he reaches his hand through. And you remember what, what the hand would represent? Yeah, the works of his hands. The works of his hands, meaning that his hands represent his works. So he says things like this when he reaches through. Do you remember when I healed you? Do you remember when I saved you? Do you remember when I broke the power of sin over you? Do you remember when I shielded you from the sun? Do you remember when I caressed you with my hand? Do you remember me? And this, this hand remembering his works, and here's the greatest one of all, the pierced hands of Jesus. Do you remember my cross? Do you remember what I did for you? And when you see that hand, the scripture says that her feelings were aroused for him. And this is what is so precious for us to remember the gospel, and in remembering the gospel, it quickens our feelings for the Lord. And you, you remember in Revelation, when they see the Lamb, what do they do? They fall on their faces and worship Him. Remember this? You remember what the, you know what the Lamb represents? The gospel. God's Lamb is Christ Jesus. On your behalf, He made Him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God. Here He is, uh, perfect in every way on our behalf. And when you look at the gospel in the Lamb of God, it causes you to fall on your face. In Lamentations 3.20, it says, remember and bow down. When you remember the Lord, it causes you to bow down. The word used for they fell down and worshiped, fell down, it, it is a word, epso, I don't know how to say it, but it means to go from a higher place to a lower place. This keeps our hearts humble before the Lord. When we look at the gospel, remember what Jesus has done, it causes us to go down low, and it creates adoration, worship. They fell down and worshiped the Lord. So I encourage you, if you don't get anything from this time that we've been together, I encourage you to make it a daily practice to remember the gospel. Some of us, I know how it is, when we've been saved a while, we move past the gospel. And we think like, oh yeah, that's the beginning. Listen, we're not... We're not just alive because of the gospel. We now live by the gospel. Yeah, right. So it didn't just come in as a foundation. It is the means by which God relates with man. Yeah. It's a constant inflow and remembrance of the gospel. If you could look through the Old Testament, one read-through and the Old Testament shows us that the human problem is forgetting. Mm-hmm. I can't tell you how many times I have written down or ch- put a check mark next to they forgot the Lord. I mean, there's, there's even a, 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 a section in Psalm, I think it's Psalm 106, where it says they danced and they sang his praise, and then the very next verse it says they forgot the Lord. Mm. So it just shows me that this is the human problem, is forgetting the Lord. But if we will remember, we can bow down. Mm. And this is where the sweetness of the Lord can be just, just, oh, just dispensed constantly in our lives. So you say, Eric, what does all this have to do with the glory of Christ? This is the glory of Christ. <laughs> the gospel is the perfections of his nature and his character. And when you gaze into it, you can see it here in the text, you are beholding the glory of God and you're being transformed into the same image. As a matter of fact, go down to 4.6. Look at this, 2 Corinthians 4.6. 
It says, For God who said, Let light shine out of darkness, is the one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. Wow. Do you see it? Radiant beams from thy holy face, Silent Night says. <laughs> His <laughs> face is his person, as a matter of fact, when I looked up the word face here, the, the person that was commentating on it says, this is the best way to describe the complete personhood. <laughs> so the complete personhood of Christ is the shining out of the gospel. I want you to notice something here. Look at what it says. It says, for God who said, let light shine out of darkness is the one who shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Meaning, this is why you're saved. Yeah. This is why he even put light on in the house. It's so that you can look in the mirror and see him who reflects God. Your life is beholding the glories of Christ. If there's any other goal, if there's any other strength, then we've missed the point. Mm. It, it, it must be our highest aim. It must be the foundation it must be our delight, and it must be our life supply that we look to the glories of Christ. And you're going to see the glories of Christ in worship and in the scriptures. And if you will give yourself completely over to a life of adoration and a life of looking by the Spirit into the text, you will become invincible. I'm telling you, you can be in the midst of a wilderness and be bearing forth fruit. Because you have your roots deep in the beholding of the glory of Christ. You know, the scripture says in, in Psalm 1, you guys know it, that, that your leaf shall not wither mm -hmm. when you are even in the midst of the desert in all seasons of life, your leaf can always be fruitful. You can mm. always have life flowing on the inside of you. And I find that a lot of people think that there's these things called dry seasons. Dry seasons, there may be all kinds of different seasons, but that doesn't mean anything about my relationship with Christ. Mm -hmm. Amen. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Because my relationship with Christ means I'm green. Yeah. I'm receiving life. Whatever season you want to put me in. Put me in ministry. Put me in, the, in, in, in you know, a foreign country on missions. Put me in a, a, a Starbucks. Put me where any season of life you want. Give me lots of money. Give me no money. It does nothing. Yeah. Yeah. To my bearing forth of fruit yes. or my, my, my leaf being green because it comes from Christ. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And, and I, I, I'm sad when I see people allow their circumstances to affect their, their internal mm -hmm. relationship with Christ. Mm -hmm. Because it just means that their relationship with Christ is external. Oh. It's, not, it's not an internal relationship mm -hmm. with Christ. Mm -hmm. Remember, Madame Guyon said... Externals of religion has, has far usurped the dominion of Christ. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people are more focused on externals, the way that they look and the way that they do things outwardly without an internal re uh, reception of the Lord. Do you remember in John 14 when Jesus is talking of the Spirit, he says that this, the world cannot see the Spirit nor know the Spirit. You remember this? Mm -hmm. And what he's saying here is specifically when you can perceive they've neither seen him nor known him it, when you perceive the spirit that's the receiving of the spirit so we turn our attention to perceive the spirit and in perceiving him we receive him mm -hmm. but the world cannot perceive him that's their fallen state therefore they can't receive him that's why there's no life on the inside of these that are walking around dead as the, as the scripture tells us that we were dead in our trespasses and sins but now he has made us alive that's the reception of the Spirit, and we live now by the same. So I say all this to say, and I, and I, I guess what I'll do is I'll just kind of, kind of pull it together here with a, with a, with a last statement, and then we'll kind of take a break maybe, and then open it up for questions, because I feel like uh, I just want to give myself to you as much as I can mm -hmm. today. We don't, we don't have a whole lot of time, but um, I want to give myself to you guys as much as I can, and whatever I can give to you. Uh, I pray that the Lord would water it and it would grow on the inside of you. But if you feel things that I've said or you feel like something that I am trying to give to you is not for you, you feel like it's just not you know, accurate, just forgive me. I'm one person in this huge kingdom. I have a small, limited perspective 
on this whole thing because I only have, I've only, I've, I'm only one guy. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? So, uh, just forgive me if you don't agree with, with something, but I do ask you to hold everything before the Lord mm-hmm. and just see if He will say it to you. Mm-hmm. But I'm not going to claim infallibility. You know what I'm saying? I'm not going to sit here and say, you know, there isn't a point in time where I might see things a little bit differently. Because, man, when I first got born again, I saw things one way. Mm. And I was right. (laughs) (laughs) Now, today, if I was sitting with myself, I would be like, you are a fool. (laughs) You understand? So it's just as we develop and we grow, we get more and more glory. How many of you recognize that God deals with you in increments? Like, in other words, he says to you, give me everything. And you say, here it is. (laughs) You give him everything. And you're just like, Lord, I give you everything. And he says, you're doing such a great job. You've given me everything. Then he says, now let me give you a little bit more light. And then he gives you more light. And then you're just like, oh, Lord, there's still things there I didn't see. And then you're like, you can have all that too. You give him everything. And he says, you're doing great. You've given me everything. You're doing great. And then he says, now let me give you a little bit more light. And he little by little just leads you like this. That's how a person can be completely surrendered and yet still have areas and issues. Like how, how... you tell me you're completely surrendered, but I, you know, I mean, I know this about you. He's dealing with him, them in increments, yeah. and he's dealing with you in increments too. Yeah. You know, so it's just important to recognize. You know, what we were talking about the other day, Finn alone said. He said, um, uh, "There's nothing more imperfect than being impatient with the imperfections of others." Yeah. It's because Adam hates to see himself in another. Right? Hey, what was the one that you told me the other day? You can't even help yourself what was it don't be mad if you can't help an- oh thomas a campus says uh do not be angry that you can't that other that you cannot make others as you wish them to be because you can't make yourself as you wish yourself to be. <laughs> <laughs> well, isn't that beautiful that's, that's dependency so i'll, I'll just kind of close out with this real quick so when we're in this place of needlessness and that's what my my main focus is today because that's beholding the glory of christ when he becomes everything to you. Mm-hmm. And we need this every single day. There's a daily knowing that comes from a daily stillness. Mm-hmm. And I, I'll be the first one to say, if I mm-hmm. uh, don't get alone with the Lord, and I allow busyness to get into my life, you see it immediately in my life. You see it in my relationship with my wife. You can see it in the way that I preach. It's just It affects every bit of my brain. How my brain thinks, I get ahead, I get anxious, uh, I trip over myself, I'm just a mess when I haven't been stilled by beholding the glories of Christ. Mm-hmm. Do you understand? Is anybody else with me on that? Yes. yes. So I encourage you, if you, well let me caution you, if you go too long like that, you'll lose your desire. Mm-hmm. This is the worst place to be mm-hmm. when you no longer desire the Lord. We can have desire for the Lord and still make mistakes. That's one thing. Mm-hmm. But when you have not come to the Lord with your mistakes and you go too long that way, what happens is it affects your brain. It affects the way that you see things and everything becomes fake to you. What do I mean? I mean like the scriptures become tasteless. Mm -hmm. And you read things like, he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. And you're just like, oh, um," you know, you don't don't even care. Do you know what I mean? There's no burning desire for Christ. Mm -hmm. And this is a bad way. Because once you start feeling numb, you're dying. Mm. And when you're dying, you move into a place of the inability to sense the Lord and the inability to desire the Lord. And now everything is just a, a, a show. You become a pageant Christian. Indeed. You're just dressing up for the pageantry, for, for people to see your externals. And then if you keep going, you'll be at a point where you don't even care about the pageantry anymore. And you'll just be like, listen, I'm going to do whatever I want to do. I'm the boss now. You know, I think Leonard Ravenel said, the greatest sin in the world is to say I can manage my life without God. That's the greatest sin in the world. Mm-hmm. So uh, this needlessness is what I want to push you to. So in this place of needlessness, you feel you need nothing. You feel you need no answers. You feel no need for explanations. Mm-hmm. You feel no need for even direction. Mm-hmm. You feel no need for, actually, even your own provisions aren't even a concern. Because you're needless. Are you saying, Eric, that I, it's wrong to ask the Lord for direction? No, I'm just saying what happens 
while we behold the glory of Christ, mm -hmm. is He so internally fulfills you that your prayers vanish in His presence. Mm -hmm. And you begin to find out that He's the only thing you ever really wanted in, anyways. Yeah. And you just thought it was this, that, and the other. But Jesus mm -hmm. slipped past all your desires and fulfilled mm -hmm. the internals. And so He just stopped up all those internal vacuums. Mm -hmm. John Piper said, sin is what we do when we're not satisfied with God. Mm -hmm. Which shows us it is a satisfaction issue that causes people to reach for other things and want other things. So look for, for pornography or competition or be relevant. Or all these things are just vacuums of the soul trying to be satisfied. And it's just indicative of the fact that you have not let Christ be all your satisfaction. There's a Russian proverb actually that says, Christ, uh, uh, God is not trying to keep pleasure from us, but to give us the highest pleasure. Mm. So when he tells you not to do these other things, he's, he's, he's telling you those things can't satisfy you. Let me give you Christ. He's the only thing that can satisfy you. And so the internals get fulfilled. He becomes joy and peace, and you're content with his countenance. You know what contentment is? It's when God is your content. <laughs> so, and then your whole heart is just my gift to you, Lord. My gift to you is my heart. How many of you, when we were quiet, you, you told the Lord, my heart is yours? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is... This is the highest thing there is. Here's my heart, Lord. Here's my heart. Here's my heart, Lord. Take it from me. Keep it, Lord, because it's safer with you than me. Take my heart, Lord. So there's nothing else that you want in this place. There's nothing else you desire. This needlessness is where the seeds get into you. You just want more of the same. He's your only desire. And the selfishness, self-life, self-significance, and self-gratification become completely unnecessary. In other words, you don't feel the need for them anymore. Is it still there? Can you still sense and know that there is a self-life and a self-will? Yes, but in needlessness, it's unnecessary. Like, I don't even need to get my own way anymore. Do you know what I mean? We have, on the inside of our blood, a burning to get our own way. And we want the things that we want when we want them. It's there. But in needlessness, you can still feel those things are there, but you're just like, this is so useless. Mm -hmm. And you can throw it away, and you don't need to get your own way. This is the key to preferring one another mm -hmm. above yourself. In honor, preferring one another. You know, putting someone above yourself, looking for, to meet the needs of another above your own. It's the product of having beheld the glories of Christ, where His light rays and character come into you. Is that making sense to you? Mm -hmm. And so, uh, he lifts us into a higher existence. That's the main thing. And we're, we transcend normal life. And all the things of this world become transparent, transient. They don't mean anything anymore. And, and I'll, I remember, I think it was Dow and I were talking one day. And he, we were saying that uh, God was able to shower Abraham with a million things without because he knew he only wanted one thing within. Wow. And, and God will bless you. He loves to provide for you. He loves to give gifts to you. I mean, uh, I mean, not many. How many of you have? Does anybody have kids here? I mean, anybody have kids here? Anybody? Nobody. No. Yeah. Uh, John, and I, John, and I have kids. But when you, you know, when you have kids, you really want to give them what they want. Christmas is coming up, and I asked my daughters for a itemized list. I want to get you everything you want, and it's my desire to do that. I want to give you everything that I possibly can. I want to do this for you. And I'm a human being with an evil heart. Mm -hmm. How much more your Heavenly Father who's all good. He wants to bless your life. He wants to give you everything that you need. He, but remember, He understands you. And though He wants to bless you and He wants to provide for you, He knows your internal condition. So we need to thank God for what He gives to us and also thank Him just as much for what He doesn't give. Because he knows what you can't handle. True. And he knows what will hurt you. Mm -hmm. And so he gives, he gives, he gives, yes. But when he doesn't do something the way that you want it, we need to have just as much trust and thanksgiving in his mm -hmm. fatherhood mm -hmm. than, as we would as if he was giving us something mm -hmm. that we wanted. Mm -hmm. And this, this keeps us free, mm -hmm. you know, constantly. Because we're all going to have times where we thought the Lord was going to do something a certain way, and he didn't. Mm -hmm. Have you had this? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's... it's Devastating when your self-life is not silenced and numb. 
I'm convinced that the afflictions of this life only injure us to the degree that our hearts are rooted in this life. Yeah. But the glories of Christ lift you from the soil of the earth and give you heavenly thoughts and a heavenly heart and a heavenly perspective, a, pers a, a anticipation for glory to come. And it, the things of this world are, are, are unable to touch us. I, I wrote this down. This is the last thing I'll say. Is if you live bowed down, everything will go over your head. And that's very important to remember. If you live low before the Lord, it doesn't matter what people say. It'll go over your head. It doesn't matter what you don't get. That'll go over your head. It doesn't matter what the devil throws at you. That'll go over your head. If you just live low at the feet of Jesus. And you say, Eric, how do I live low? Look at the Lamb. Remember and bow down the glories of Christ.